Transit Advocacy is never follow Stephanie. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Kane. Uh, I'm the budget policy analyst for the MBTA advisory board. I don't have a slide, but we're going to leave help up here. Yeah, I figured you'd like it's that. It's really important. Um, it's really an honor to be here with uh, three of the best uh, best minds working in the nation right now on, on transportation issues. These three individuals often speak at uh, in Washington, D.C., at TRB, and, and other national conferences. It's really an honor. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. But uh, I'm an alumnus of this institution. I got my MPA here in Northeastern. I'd like to say hello to Dean Bluestone. Um, it's great to be back. Uh, love it here. And what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is this. This is the MBTA Advisory Board's counter proposal. And there's some copies over here if you don't have them. And what we did, the Advisory Board, as I mentioned, represents the 175 cities and towns in the MBTA Service District. That's every city and town from here to the Cape Cod Canal to the New Hampshire border to west of Worcester to the Rhode Island border. It's basically half the state, three quarters of the state's population, and um, almost every single town in there, with some exceptions, uh, pays assessments every year to the MBTA. And that's based on population. So cities and towns with greater population like Boston pay more than cities and towns like um, Ashburnham, which pay a lot less. But they all told us T means our help. The advisory board has been in existence since 1964 when the T was created. And um, our members are mayors and uh, chairman of boards of selectmen. And we had the first public hearing uh, on, the, on, the, on the fair and service changes proposal on January 9th, the day after it was publicly announced. And what our board told us to do was go out there and do, try to figure out something else that could be, that was feasible, that could be implemented, and that could, that could, be, could be put in place by the end of the next fiscal year, which is the end of next June, that would get the T $160 million. Now, Stephanie has mentioned that she's absolutely right that we have a, a lar much larger crisis than $161 million. My attitude is that, you know, the ship's on fire right now. The MBTA is not only on fire, it's sinking in a sinkhole and asteroids are crashing into it. You know, it's really... <laughs> <laughs> but let's get through this year. Let's try to stabilize the finances for one year to provide a window of opportunity. We can finally begin to, to address the problems that Stephanie very very clearly articulated that we have, which is the giant debt, the lack of revenue, and a lot of the expenditure stuff. We can get to that. But I just want to run through briefly our counter proposal because I think what we tried to do was not only close the deficit this year, but set the table for the broader discussion to close the larger problems next year. We support, and this might not be the most popular thing to say, we support a 25% fare increase. I think Stephanie laid out a lot of the reasons why it might make sense. 25% um, would raise approximately 75 to $80 million in new revenue next year. Uh, we think there is a good political reason to say that the rider should pay more. Um, you're not going to get any more service. There's been a lot of talk about that. I think we all know why. The team can't afford any new service. But we think a 25% fare increase, since there hasn't been one since 2007, is, is, remar is actually fair. And while um, in our, uh, our fare increase is 25% across the board which is, we think, a little more equitable than, than the proposals put forward by the T, which called for, in some cases, 150% increases. Um, but we can talk about that. Um, the other thing that we, we also then sort of got creative. And we sort of believe that we can find an additional 80 million uh, from other measures. We think there's an, another $71 million from transportation reform that has not yet been realized. Now, the legislature would have to work on this. There was actually a public hearing today on some of this, and I testified. For instance, the MBTA has its own police force, the MBTA Transit Police. I'm not sure if you've ever seen them out on the revenue vehicles. Um, they hang at models a lot. They hang at models? Very good, very good. Um, they are a fully trained, fully accredited police force. They do a remarkably difficult job that I could never do. They cost a lot of money. And the advisory board is, a, is under the believes that they would be better off housed by the, as part of the Massachusetts State Police, which is the similar way that policing is provided to Massport and to the old Turnpike Authority, which no longer exists. In these cases, state police um, divisions uh, are assigned to those. And we think that would save about $36 million a year um, in addition, in this year, and in addition, and provide more savings in the years to come through things like efficiencies, not having to buy cruisers and jackboots and bullets and everything else. Um, we support shifting the cost of riding the ferries to Massport. The MBTA um, is one of the only transit agencies in America that runs ferries as part of the rest of its 
core systems. We did a little research. Um, there are other ferry operators, but there's very few that are integrated as part of larger transit systems. We think the, the Mass Port is a much better operator of ferries, given that it operates the Port of Boston. It has uh, well over 50 years of experience running boats in and around Boston Harbor. And the dirty little secret is that the MBTA really doesn't want to be in the ferry business anymore. They've tried to get rid of the ferries every other year for the last four years. You know, it's just not something they want to be, a business they want to be in. And we can argue about whether or not they should, but we happen to believe that Massport should pick up that thing. And we think there's a lot of leverage on that. I think the legislature is actually going to, going to work on that with us. We also support selling a lot of assets that the MBTA owns along the waterfront to Massport, which we believe Massport could use to, through development to pay for the operations of the ferries. Um, there's a private carrier and suburban bus program that the T runs now. These are sort of relics of the 70s when there was all these movements to get community buses and shuttle buses around. They're very small. They don't really carry many people. They're on the books still. Uh, the Mission Hill uh, Link bus is one of them. Unlike Mastodon's proposal, which is to just eliminate the subsidy, we think that the subsidy should be retained, but it should be paid for by other entities within Mastodon. There's an entity in Mastodon, the Department of Transportation, called Mass Rides. Mass Rides coordinates and funds through grants uh, transportation management associations, which run shuttle buses for corporations and employees in certain geographic areas. We think there's a natural synergy here between those sort of services, which tend to run smaller buses, not the big buses that he runs, um, more of, a, more of a, a retail instead of a wholesale business. So we think there's some, there's some synergy there that, that Mass DO, the DOT could pick up those things. Um, my favorite one here is the, uh, the homeless, um, homeless buses. The MBTA runs three buses right now, the 275, 276, and 277, that serve uh, the homeless population of the city. The city of Boston's largest homeless shelter is on Long Island up in Boston Harbor, and that's where the largest shelter is. And every day, the MBTA runs buses from Long Island into the Boston Common Area and from the Boston Common Area back out to Long Island. They also run a bus to the Shattuck Hospital down the road. The T doesn't collect fares on these. They're homeless. They don't have any money. Um, and it is a remarkably expensive cost to run, believe it or not. It costs about $1.3 million a year. It's purely a social service cost that we don't believe the transit agency should be paying for. MassDOT, the MBTA, the DOT, have proposed eliminating the buses, the routes altogether. I'm not sure what would happen to the homeless people in those cases, but we think that, um, that other state entities that fund uh, health care or services for homeless people should pick up those costs. And uh, in fact, Mayor Menino, in his letter to the uh, MBTA Board of Directors, singled out these buses in particular as, as needing to be saved. We agree, and we've put forward this proposal, which we think would help. We think there's some traction on that. Um, we get more interesting now in our belief in what we call innovation and restructuring. Uh, we call for, for no pay increases for MBTA employees uh, in FY13. Um, there's a myth out there that MBTA employees are sort of uh, well-paid fat cats. Uh, it's just not true. Uh, there's uh, about 6,000 MBTA employees. All but 200 of them are unionized. The non-unionized MBTA employees have not had a pay raise since, didn't have a pay raise between 2006 and 2012. And January of 2012, they got a, uh, I think it was a 1.5% merit-based pay raise. Um, now, that's very common in America in the recession that we're in. Um, the unionized employees uh, did a lot better. Uh, most of them saw three, 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 and four percent raises every year, sometimes four, sometimes retroactive pay increases uh, that, that sort of whack the T's budget for 65 million bucks all at once. Now, it's remarkably difficult to operate an MBTA vehicle, and I could never do it. And these people deserve to be well paid. But, as I mentioned, the asteroids are hitting the MBTA right now. We're in a crisis, and we think that there's got to be shared sacrifice. If riders are going to be asked to pay more, I think that the T employees, especially the unionized employees who've done very well, should also take a little bit less so we can have shared sacrifice. Thank you. Um, now, institutional beneficiaries. This is where we get really interesting. A lot of places have names, their names attached to, to T stations, one of which is Northeastern, you know, the Northeastern Green Line Station. Harvard, BC, BU, BU's got three. Uh, Mass General Hospital, MGH, MIT. We think there's a value to having your name associated with an MBTA station. We think that you should pay for that value. I'm not sure this is really a radical concept, but no one's ever sort of put it out there before that I know of. Uh, we think there's two to three million dollars a year that could be raised, and you know the 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 state agency tends to um, tends to like to study things and hire consultants to go out and do stuff. My attitude is just send them a bill. You know what? Send Northeastern a bill. 
assign a value, send them a bill. And if they don't pay it, change the name. Paint over it. If there is a value, they'll pay for it. You know, like I said, we're in a crisis. Um, <laughs> the year we, we call for, um, we, we agree that there should be a UPASS program similar to Chicago. And you know, 100 bucks a semester is, is a real good bargain. We propose $10 a year just to get it started. And uh, after hearing what Stephanie said, we should probably increase that. Um, <laughs> 10 bucks a year is three pennies a day. And we think that most college students could afford that. And we think most college students could shift that cost onto the financial aid, which is another way of just saying shifting it onto uh, their parents or the federal government in most cases. And uh, we think that this is a great way to start the UPASS program discussion. Because once you're paying for something, you actually care about it more. And studies have shown that around the world. Um, Large beneficiaries of weekend light rail service. We heard at public hearings in places like Jamaica Plain and Mattapan, um, Roxbury, the Boston Public Library, how important the E-Line in particular is on weekends and how it shouldn't be eliminated. And we agree. We agree. Um, we heard from people that attend this institution, that attend uh, Wentworth, that like to go to the Museum of Fine Arts, that go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, um, how important it is. We agree. But if it's that important, you gotta put some money on the table. Like I said, we're in a crisis. It's one and a half million bucks to, we, we will be saved from cutting the green line off on the weekends and the Mattapan high speed line. And our attitude is, yeah, it's that important, you gotta find a way to pay for it. Now I'm not saying, I'm, I don't know if there's a legal mechanism that we can do to force you to pay that, but my attitude is that uh, the presidents of institutions like this and like, like the ones down the road, Mass College of Art, et cetera, should just get in a room and say, if the E-Line is important to our constituents and our people and our students and our academic and our, and our employees, we gotta put some money on the table for it. Um, we also call for a 50 cent surcharge on all sporting events. Um, the, the idea is that whenever there's a Red Sox game, there's a mini rush hour. Uh, whenever there's a Bruins game, there's a mini rush hour. The proposals that the, the T has put forward would eliminate commuter rail after 10 o'clock at night, every night, and weekend service on the commuter rail. You can't get home if you live north of Boston and want to go to a Bruins or, or a Celtics game <coughs> by public transportation if that doesn't exist, which means you can't go to the game because you don't know if the game's going to end before 10 or not. Our attitude is that there's uh, millions of dollars generated every year for the private entities that make a lot of money putting on these things. 50 cents per ticket would generate several million dollars a year, which could be fun, which could pay for the cost of providing those very expensive weekend and late night services that, that a lot of people to go to and from sporting events. Those would cost a lot of money because they're mostly done on overtime. Uh, the team doesn't know when the games are going to be. Well, they do when the games are going to be, but they don't. Sometimes it's on a Tuesday, sometimes it's on a Thursday. You can't plan a schedule around it for an employee schedule. So it costs a lot of money to do, and it mostly is done with overtime. And we think that's a, a very equitable thing to do. Finally, uh, from attending all of these hearings, we heard a lot of stuff. People, there's a belief out there, and I think it's true, that the T is not doing enough to collect all the fare money it's owed. That fare evasion is rampant. Um, I see it, I, I take the green line every day, and I, you know, I'm not sure the last time I had to tap my pass was. Um, so we want the MassDOT board to immediately begin quantifying how much fare revenue they believe is lost and issuing new policies and procedures to collect those fares. Uh, some ideas are barrier, uh, barrier, Josh, not like this, barriers, uh, tolling or fare collection on the D line, on the E, on the e line, uh, taking some of the customer service agents out of stations downtown, like Boylston, in the middle of the day, where they sit in those little booths, and put them on the platforms out here uh, in the rush hour. We think that's just sort of common sense. Um, paratransit, uh, the ride is a is a, is a very very expensive and very very important service to run. Uh, right now, um, if you live, for instance, in Gloucester and want to take paratransit to get into Boston, you, you, have to get, uh, you have to get on the Cape Ann Regional Transit Authority service, go to probably to Beverly, transfer to the ride, which is the MBTA's one, and then come in. You pay two fares and you make transfers twice to get home, to get there and back. We think there should be a statewide paratransit authority. It makes no sense in this day and age, in my opinion, to have 16 different paratransit agencies in the state. Not every city and town is in. There's also Health and Human Service provided paratransit. There's also local city and town provided paratransit. We think it's a no-brainer. And in fact, the Inspector General of the Commonwealth 
uh, just last week published a report that largely agreed with our, uh, our plan, although uh, he probably had his up first. Um, there's also been a lot of talk by the Secretary about value capture, that we're going to pay for future expansion by using a value capture. Value capture is uh, a property uh, that you put transit in, the property near transit increases in, in its value, you can capture some of that value. Except uh, it's been discussed now at, at, at MBT and the DOT for, for well over a decade, and we haven't seen anything yet. We want to see some movement on that. And finally, um, our proposal calls for no service cuts. Uh, we don't think there should be any service cuts. But we do think there should be what we're calling a watch list, which is not every single bus route that exists today should or will exist forever. Some of these bus routes cost about $13 per person to operate. That's every time it gets on, you, every time individuals board these particular routes, they cost the MBTA $13 over and above their fare revenue to provide that trip. It's just too much. The average is about $4. I'm sorry, no, the average is about $1.70. No, that's not right. You know what the average is? Three bucks. Three, 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 three thirty. That's my third hearing today. Third meeting today. Um, we think there should be a watch list. So if your route is in danger of being eliminated, that you should go on this list and people should be given the opportunity to save their routes because we heard at a lot of these public hearings that how important these routes are. We want to give the public a chance to save their routes, to find ways to work with local businesses to get more revenue, to increase ridership, to figure out ways that they can be saved by working with the metrics. So we want a watch list and uh, that will not eliminate procedures, will not eliminate routes this year. And finally, um, we think that the figurative annual bloodletting, uh, or not, a, not annual, biannual at this point, of fare increases has to stop. We think there should be, instead of price spikes of 25, 35, or 45 percent every five years, small regular fare increases around two and a half to three, five percent, whatever it is, they can figure it out. And we think that would be much more uh, equitable and easier to, uh, to assume uh, for the individual. And finally, um, what we really want is the adult conversation to begin immediately. We've been talking about the crisis we have in public transportation for so long. What we really need at this point, what we need more than anything else, is leadership. We need help, but we need leadership. And I'm not sure who's going to lead us out of this, this abyss that we're in right now, but someone's got to do it soon, because we can't be back here doing this again next year. It's just not sustainable, it's just not functional, and it's no way to run a railroad. Thank you.